we're going to just have a quick look at water chemistry in terms of the diversity of the chemical environment. I could spend the next hour just talking about water chemistry on Georgian Bay. But I want to look at this from, the, from an ecosystem perspective in terms of diversity of habitat. The far side, as you saw, is limestone. Limestone bedrock is soluble. So water out here is basic, has dissolved minerals in it, is relatively hard. The opposite is true on the shield. The shield drains uh, bogs and, uh, and wetlands that are acidic. They're on granite bedrock, which is insoluble. So the type of water coming in here is very different than out here. Look at just a couple of parameters. <coughs> Conductivity is a measure of the amount of dissolved minerals in the water, how hard or soft the water is. <coughs> So at 17, this is very soft water with very little dissolved minerals. 17, 85, 126, 135, 170, 180, 185. Look at the gradient of water chemistry, just looking at dissolved minerals in the water. In most lakes, this is almost instantaneous mixing. But because these are going into an archipelago, you have differential dilution all through the archipelago. Same for pH. At 5.3, draining this acidic wetland, that's a low pH. There's quite a bit of aquatic life that can't live below a pH of 5. It's that acidic. pH goes from 5.3, 6.4, 7.2, 8.1, 8.2, up to 8.3. This water's basic, alkalinity. It's got calcium carbonate from the limestone. And the last one, water clarity. Water coming from here tends to be brown, um, yellow, stained with acids. Clarity is 1.3 meters to 1.7, 1.8, 2.8, 3.5, up to 9.5 meters. There are places out here where water clarity is 40 to 50 feet deep. Here we only have one meter. <coughs> so the point is that here is an incredible diversity of water chemistry a gradient that organisms, plants, animals, amphibians, reptiles, whatever, that prefer, you know, a range of this type of water chemistry. That is available within the archipelago because it's, it's this unique differential of water chemistry going through. Now this is a very small tributary with larger tributaries like the Musquash, the Moon River, the Magnetowan. Uh, it can be even more uh, exaggerated as it goes through, say, Woods Bay and, uh, you know, out towards San Susi. But again, the point I want to make, this is a very diverse chemical environment. So you saw an incredibly diverse physical environment, on top of which there's an incredibly diverse chemical environment. Again, something that does not exist in any of the other Great Lakes. Okay, that all gives rise to a biological environment or the biological component of the ecosystem that's equally unique and diverse. This is up near the French River. Just, just have a look, say at the terrestrial side, these offshore islands have almost no biodiversity on them. There's very little plant growth, very little animal life on them. They're exposed, they're extreme. As you go inshore, you get islands with some plant growth, biodiversity <coughs> increasing, to the larger islands, to the mainland where you have large, dense forests. The same is true in the aquatic environment. These shoals out here are, are battered by storms and waves and, you know, they're just, they're just washed bedrock. There's no aquatic plant growth. As you get in here where they're protected, um, a lot more aquatic plant growth, a lot more biodiversity with onshore coastal wetlands. So again, quite a, quite a gradient from offshore to inshore. These are biodiversity gradients. As you go from here to here to here to here, biodiversity increases and increases dramatically from extremely low to some of the highest <laughs> biodiversity that exists anywhere in Canada. Again, because of the diverse physical and chemical environment. It's another example, the offshore islands, very little uh, terrestrial life, same on the aquatic side. These are extreme, harsh environments. Actually, a lot of these pictures are taken on land trust properties. So uh, you'll recognize some of them. Offshore exposed areas, I mean, the, the kind of uh, plant growth is uh, gray and orange lichens and a few perennials growing in some of the cracks. 
very harsh environment, very low biodiversity. As you get a little more interior, uh, you're starting to get some sedges, some mosses, a little bit of soil creation in these pockets, but still, uh, still a pretty extreme environment, but higher biodiversity. To show you how extreme this environment is, this white pine has been growing there for almost 40 years, living in a, crock, uh, in a crack in the bedrock, exposed to summer droughts and extreme you know, winter exposure. It looks pretty lonely out there. <laughs> Southeast Wooded Island, a good example. A very harsh aquatic environment and very uh, limited biological activity. This is the same island. Uh, just want to describe a little bit about the ecology of what happens on some of these islands. These pockets have organic soil that's accumulated over many centuries that can only hold so much moisture. So in the spring and during rainfalls, these, these hold moisture, and in a cycle of every 10 to 15 years, and we've all seen it, we get an extremely dry summer. And during a dry drought summer, depending on what kind of a reservoir of water these pockets have, they will dry out, and in the extreme year, the younger pines and the younger birch trees will die. They'll die of summer drought because these micro habitats simply can't support them. Or, as in the case of this pine tree, the tree will outgrow that the site. The top mass of the tree will get too large, the root system can't hold it, a windstorm will come along and it'll blow over and the root system just peels off the bedrock. And we've all seen that. That's what happened, this is the predecessor of this tree. It grew and that site blew over, the organic materials you know, eroded off the site and this tree grew. And that's just a succession that occurs in these offshore islands. A little more inland, uh, got a little more soil development, stunted pines, higher biodiversity. <coughs> but look at these islands in the winter. This is the same island I was showing you, the lizard. In the winter, there's basically no overwintering habitat on these islands. Reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals, they can use these places in the summer, but there's no overwintering habitat. So they have to move to larger islands as part of their home range. Finally, on the big islands and on the mainland, we have the highest biodiversity. Diverse mixed hardwood plant communities, high biodiversity of, of animals. These areas have habitat that provides overwintering conditions for most of the large mammals that live on the coast. Woodpeckers, you know, the, the birds that overwinter, can't live on those outer islands, not during the winter. So, uh, secure habitats nearby are critical for their survival. And one of the most unique features of the Georgian Bay Coast, many of you have met Pat Chow Fraser over the years, um, who's been studying and documenting these coastal wetlands. The Georgian Bay Coast has the best quality, uh, the highest density of coastal wetlands anywhere in the Great Lakes. Here's an example. Two islands providing protection for the development of this kind of a wetland between two shelter islands. Now these wetlands are critical habitat for waterfowl, shorebirds, reptiles, amphibians, aquatic mammals, and many of the fish species that spawn in this habitat. And because we have so much of this type of habitat, we also have the highest density and diversity of those kinds of organisms. Coastal marshes um, on the coast of Georgian Bay. The other significant kind of wetland, oh, some of these are quite large complexes. Those of you from Madawaska Club will recognize this area. But look at the, look at the, the complex of this wetland. It doesn't exist like this anywhere else in the Great Lakes. Same place uh, at ground level, exceptional diversity of plants and animals. Coastal wetlands have the highest biodiversity of any habitat. Subject to water level fluctuations, when water levels drop and this same wetland is reduced to this, a lot of the biological functions are greatly reduced. But the wetland doesn't die. I mean, a lot of these tubers are simply waiting for water levels to come up. And in fact, fluctuating water levels are actually good for the health of wetlands as long as it comes back up. Okay, the other kind of wetland um, are the interior bogs. And on the shield, um, these are very abundant, as you know. They're, they tend to be regulated, there's a beaver den, they tend to be regulated by beavers, beaver dams. They're acidic, they're, uh, it, this is brown, 
sustained, acidic, <coughs> low dissolved nutrient water. Very different from the coastal wetlands. But again, it provides that diversity of wetland habitat that's unique to the Georgian Bay coast. This is a bog wetland on one of the islands. Most of the islands, if they're large enough, actually have perched bogs on them. So here you have a perched bog on, the, on an island in the archipelago providing this acidic wetland habitat. And just over the hill, you have a, a coastal marsh, which is very different water chemistry, very different e ecology, in close proximity. Again, that, that simply doesn't exist anywhere else. 